Services, where he resides in Portland with his wife, Lori. So please welcome Mr. Greg May. Thank you. I should have made that shorter. All you need to say is that I work, uh, I work in the lending industry. Thank you very much for participating. I, I'd like to have some interaction, so we'll, we'll have some interaction tonight, and I think it makes it more enjoyable. Certainly for me, I get sick of standing and talking, so I'll love some input and some questions. I, I do start out, first of all, by saying I was asked by, uh, as you can see up there, by the Tompkins County Council of Governments task of uh, gas drilling to come and speak to them about a year and a half ago about what, if there, if there were any conflicts between residential mortgage lending and the proposed gas drilling. And as I put that stuff together for the Tompkins County Council of Governments, it started to gain a life of its own. And what I'm going to do is summarize eight or ten points. We'll talk about those points a little bit. We'll have a little bit of uh, um, fun while we're doing it. We'll, again, one of the things that I try to do, and that's why I start out with this notice, I'm not trying to say I am for or against. I'm trying to present information. I'll leave the decisions to you folks on what you're going to do. What I'm going to do is try to tell you some of the conflicts that exist and how you might be able to um, avoid some of those, um, how you might be able to work around some of those. Fair? Consult a real estate attorney. It's one of the things, I'm a banker, and we always, bankers always talk about risk, and I will always say consult a real estate attorney. And that's not a real estate attorney that um, just anyone. Get somebody that has some skills in um, reviewing these gas leases. They're very complex. Um, they're very, very detailed. There's a lot of um, things to, to look at. We're going to talk about just a few of those in the next hour or so, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. One of the things that I start with is how real estate is sold in New York State. Can I do that? Maybe it's not going to work. Ah, there you go. Uh, you'll see up there it says fee simple. Um, fee simple ownership is common in New York State. Other states have what they call split estates, where they will separate what's on the surface of the land from what's below the surface of the land, what's called subsurface. In New York, what's common is that you're, you're buying real estate in a fee simple ownership. Fee simple is, it is simply that you're buying a wedge of earth. You're buying a wedge of this from the center of the earth to the heavens above. That's definition. Right out of the pricing guidelines, right out of the lending guidelines. So you're buying dirt and rocks and water and bugs and whatever else is underneath the ground. Um, and you're buying the, the surface and you're buying the air above it. So fee simple ownership is common in New York State. That is the typical way that title is transferred from one borrower to another, one owner to another. And it's for the quiet enjoyment of whoever holds that fee simple ownership, meaning that they can do what they want as long as it's legal um, on their land. They can um, build. They might have to get a. Uh, a a building permit, but they could build a farm, they could build, uh, they could plant a tree, they could plant shrubs, they could do what they want to the surface of the land and the subsurface. As long as it doesn't impact someone else or break the law. Everyone have a pretty good understanding of what fee simple is now because a lot of this that we talked about today is going to be based on fee simple ownership. Yeah? There's a couple of folks in the audience that I see now, and there's another few that are not quite sure. We'll start from here. If you've got questions, let's talk about them. Any idea in New York State what the reg is right now, the regulations are right now, for the distance between a well pad and a residential improvement? A residential improvement would be the house, the well, the septic, a barn, an outbuilding, a garage. Any idea regulatory-wise right now in New York State what the regulatory setback distance is, the distance between the well pad and that residential improvement? 100 feet. 100 feet's right. 
100 feet. Commercial properties are 150 feet. That's by regulation today in New York State. Many leases that you see will have some language in them that say, I, the, the gas driller, will not drill within 200 feet of a residential improvement. But then they add a little sentence after that, a little uh, couple of words, unless the borrower or the owner gives me permission. And here's where one of the conflicts exists. <clears throat> Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are the industry standards in the United States for <coughs> regulations, guidelines for residential mortgage lending. By the way, for sure, I'm going to write this down because this is actually on hand out over here. Save me from scratching all these notes. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac set the industry standards for residential mortgage lending guidelines in the United States. There are estimates out there, and depending on who you read, something north of 90% of the loans in the United States are originated under guidelines established by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or the other two biggies, FHA and VA. We'll talk about them in just a minute. <coughs> FHA is Federal Housing Administration, VA Veterans Administration. Okay? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have very similar rules. I'm going to quote Freddie Mac's um, in, in my discussions today, but Fannie Mae is are very, very similar in wording. I also put up there one of the others, Sunny May. Anybody know what Sunny May stands for? S-O-N-Y-M-A? I know there's at least one banker in the room, so I know that they know. There might be two. There's another guy dressed in a suit like me. <laughs> State of New York Mortgage Agency. State of, State of New York has their own mortgage program for first-time home buyers of moderate income. Their guidelines specifically say we'll follow Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidelines. Freddie Mac indicates there can be no surface or subsurface entry within 200 feet of a residential improvement. So you see already we've got a conflict with New York State regulations say of 100 feet, Fannie and Freddie say 200 feet, and now let's take one step back again to be simple ownership in New York State where you're not buying just the surface of the land, you're buying that wedge of property from the center of the earth to the heavens above. So there cannot be any, to meet any made for any guidelines, any entry, any, anything going on in that wedge of earth from the center of the earth to the heavens above back 200 feet from the residential improvements. I, I, I should have thought to get a, uh, a poster board or something to, to jot on, but I can, I'm pretty resilient. <clears throat> Anybody know what a 208 by 208 <coughs> feet, what that is? That's an acre, right? So if you put your house in the center and you've got to have a 200 foot setback in all directions, You're about 400 and some feet by 400 and some feet. Would you say that that's accurate? Assuming that the house and the, and the well and the septum of the barns maybe take another 50 or 60 feet square, that would be cramping them together. That's about five acres. If you do the math, about 450 feet by 450 feet square footage means that there cannot be any any activity, either surface, no drilling, or subsurface, underneath, in a five acre parcel surrounding the house. That's by guideline. It's not up for interpretation by me any longer because I called Freddie Mac and I said, what's the guideline? I want to be sure I understand. And they have confirmed that that is in fact the guideline. Again, because in New York, we buy real estate in a fee simple ownership. We don't split estates. 
It may be different in other states. I'm not going to talk about that, where they separate surface and subsurface rights. But in New York, that's not common. It's not been done very often. It's just starting, in some instances, where a seller will say, I'll sell you the property, but I want to retain the mineral rights underneath. Now, this paper that I've done and the points has been circulated widely. It's been in the Wall Street Journal. It's been in the Bar Journal. There's been, I've been on some TV shows um, talking about it. And it's been picked up by the attorney generals in many states. There's about seven or eight states now that have contacted me that have, in fact, taken the points and then gone off to verify themselves and confirmed that that is an issue. No one watched for that when they were setting up the guidelines for drilling. And that's a problem. Questions? Did our Attorney General contact you? Pardon me? Did our New York State Attorney General I've, I've been to uh, Albany oh, five or six or seven times. I've, I've talked to Governor directly, <laughs> Governor's uh, you know, aides. I've talked to the Assembly. Um, Barbara Lipton is, uh, uh, excuse me, Lipton is uh, an assembly person there who is very active. She's from the Ithaca Cortland area and very active in introducing bills in the assembly to try to rectify this, to try to establish that buffer zone, that 200 by 200, you know, on all sides. So it would be about a five acre uh, parcel. So, yes, I have been to Albany uh, quite a few times. If somebody, done, if somebody drills far enough away that they do that side drill and they go on my into my property, do I, since I own everything to the center of the earth, do I have any right to say I want to? It's, it's one of the problems in the rules right now is that they have what's called compulsory integration in New York State, which says if once they establish a drilling unit, drilling unit in theory is 640 acres of land and it could be a rectangle, could be a square, could be any geometric <coughs> if you want it to be. Uh, once they establish that, once they get 60 percent, uh, I've got a cough drop because I've been um, scratching voice, 60 percent of that drilling unit under lease by what's called compulsory immigration in New York State, the other 40 percent are automatically grandfathered, if you will, in. It's almost like eminent domain, where the, the state allows the gas company the rights to drill under. So it's a problem. It's a problem with the rents. It's got to be corrected. I've talked to Albany many times, and, and that's something that I'm still working on with, with Albany, trying to get them to they, they manage the issue. Um, but it, it is a problem. This, this young lady was, was first. I'll be right back. 600 acres does not have to be connected either. Um, it, it, it does not have to be necessarily connected. It can be Clinton, it can be Vernon, and all that in the world. Um, and and there's, there's some, there's some caveats to that, but, um, you know, it does not have to, it certainly does not have to be geometric in nature. It could be multi-sided, it could have, you know, jigs and jags and whatever, but they have to apply, the, the gas companies have to apply to New York State. They have to be given the, the right for a drilling unit, and then once they have that, once they get 60% of that, then the other 40% come upon that. Pardon me? You don't believe in the money that's being offered not to be able to offer this? <clears throat> Sir, uh, I guess I'm here under a different understanding of what this meeting was about. And I look here and I'm, my question really that interests me very much, and I don't know whether you are in a position to answer it, is to exactly what happens to the water chemicalized that they use to reach the deep frame. You have no... I, I would not... Something completely out of my scheme of, of understanding. 
It's not that I'm being rude, but that's this, right. this is my, my main interest. I'll okay. pass you well. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Maybe you're going to lead up to this, uh, Mr. Mayor, but uh, the problem I see with what you've explained so far is simply the fact that mortgages are bought and sold on the secondary mortgage market, whereby you need a, a standard that everyone can live with. Mm -hmm. And without that standard, you corrupt the ability of mortgages to be bought and sold on the secondary mortgage market. You're absolutely right. And that's why I'm out trying to educate people on what the conflicts are. That's why I'm here tonight. That's why I broke two hours is to, to really talk about that and to tell you, tell people, help educate people that there is a conflict. And I'm going to have several more points that we're going to make right along that line. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, we talked about. Sunny Mae adopts those same guidelines. FHA and VA have similar restrictions that there cannot be any surface or subsurface entry within 300 feet of this wedge. So they're even further apart. They have bigger setbacks. And they actually go on in, in FHA guidelines in their minimum property standards. And, and you see up there, I've quoted the chapter in verse 4150.2, actually is the exact uh, guideline. And in the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac, there was, uh, I think it was 39 something, I've got to go out 39.4. <coughs> um, there cannot be any surface or subsurface entry within 300 feet of the property boundary. So they go on even further, not only just that particular residential improvement, but the boundaries of the property that, that FHA and VA finance. So again, to the point there, is that when you're talking about 90 plus percent of the residential mortgage loans in the United States, by secondary market standards, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Sunny Mae by default, FHA and VA all have this setback, this exclusion that is far greater than the law, the regulation currently in New York State provides for. And there's a conflict. So that if your banker, some know better than others, but if your banker finds that there is a lease on your property and there's not at least that five acres, and by the way, if we do the math, and if we did 300 by 300, you know, in each direction, like I said here, mathematically is about nine and a half acres. So it's even bigger. If they grant you a mortgage and believe that it's a, a, available for sale in the secondary market, they're incorrect. It is not. There are lenders out there that don't know that yet, that haven't internalized it yet, because it's not come to the point where there's drilling. And the issue really comes from the fact that this is not your grandfather's well. Your grandfather's well was a vertical well that they would put a little pad up, they drill straight down, they come to a pocket, they might have hydrofract that by pumping water straight down to frack right below where it was. But from a lending standpoint, we as a lender could go up to the property, we see that, we see what impact it has on, uh, on the property, and we can say, no, we're not gonna finance that property on a residential basis. It's a commercial endeavor. Now what does that mean to you and I in this room and our kids? It is right now, interest rates are at near historic lows for residential. Their fixed rates are in um, a, a range of about 4%. I'm supposed to, Steve will, will know this, I'm supposed to say an APR with that, but I am not trying to present any product for you to buy. You don't get 4% 30-year fixed rate loans in the commercial world. 
They may be fixed for a few years with balloons. They may be adjustable. They're tied to prime. They're tied to some other index where they could be adjustable. Significantly higher cost. Typically. So we've, we've talked about fee simple. We've talked about 200 foot setback with Fannie and Freddie. We've talked about a 300 foot setback with FHA. Let's talk about homeowners insurance. <clears throat> I'm mindful of the times because I want to leave some, some time at the end for questions. Homeowners insurance is a requirement of every residential mortgage loan. I called some agents I know in my particular geographic market area and said, what if I put a gas lease on my property? Would you, in fact, change my homeowners insurance? It's required by my bank that I have homeowner's insurance for the life of my loan. <clears throat> and the agents said, no, won't make any difference. I wasn't quite sure I was in the same place as that agent, or actually a number of agents. So I called the companies directly. Companies like um, Travelers, Safeco, um, Kemper, Preferred. So big companies, not little companies. Each and every one of them said, look at the policy. There's an exclusion or a number of exclusions in the policy that would exclude coverage for a commercial endeavor on the property. So I said, let's talk about a gas lease. And they said, if there was a gas lease on the property and we knew about it, we would not be able to, to offer homeowner's insurance to that borrower because the fees are nowhere near adequate to cover the risk. Now that's coming from the company, not your, your agent on the corner, who may not understand the company's philosophy. No disrespect to those agents, they do a great job but this is more complicated. Is this like about the difference between residential and commercially zoned property? So no matter what the commercially commercial property endeavor on the property was, the insurance wouldn't apply anymore because this was an residential property. There very well could be in a residential homeowner's policy an exclusion that would exclude coverage as a result of any loss or damage based on a commercial endeavor. Okay. So, so what if the property, what if the house is in a commercially zoned area? Uh, I, again, we're, we're talking apples and oranges here. The zoning doesn't really have anything to do with that. No. What it does have is the homeowner's policy the policy itself, your fire insurance that you have on your residence, in that fine print. You know when you get your package, there's 30 pages. Did any of us read it? I'm in the business and I don't read it, so. In there, it says, we'll cover except, and then it will list a bunch of exceptions, exclusions. And those exclusions in that homeowner's policy will say, except, for loss as a result of a commercial endeavor on a residential property. Doesn't have to do with zoning, it has to do with use. You should have a smaller print too. Right? <laughs> my, my guess. <laughs> <laughs> zoning is something that the town sets. Now, can you get coverage? <coughs> yes, I'm sure you can. <laughs> But the cost of that coverage is not going to be the same as the cost of your coverage on your typical homeowner's insurance. I have a $200,000 house, give or take, in Cortland, New York, where I live, and I just got my renewal, and it was $676 a year for homeowner's three, extended coverage. I've got a couple of little small riders to add some extra uh, coverage because I've got a pool. Um, but it was 700 bucks. You're not going to get coverage at $700 if there's a gas drill, grass rig on your property, 
And if the company knows that there's a lease, they may not even insure it. When you go to get your insurance, your agent says, what, what's the property that you're going to buy? It's 123 Main Street. Great, here's what I think it's going to be based on their charts. They go out to the property to take a picture. They look at the property. If you've ever had one that you bought that had you know, some paint peeling or not enough, the, the handrails weren't there, you'll get a letter back from the agent, from the company a month after you buy and you're in the property that says, you know, we noticed that you don't have a handrail on the front steps. We need you to put a handrail on. They go there. If they don't see it, they're not focused on that. So because there's not been drilling yet, be careful. You may have excluded, with a leash, you may exclude some of the coverage that you thought you had. Conflict with a mortgage loan. It's required. Whose uh, responsibility is to, to do all that stuff? To, to do what? Insurance? <coughs> or the bank? Well, my son's in the whole buying age, and uh, he showed me a picture of a piece of property, and it looked just like a well pad was going in. Said you better be careful, it might be a fracking zone. Well, he's 28, he doesn't know what fracking is. So who's supposed to tell him? You, realtor, bank, an insurance company? If in fact uh, he ha has a good real estate attorney, well, that real estate attorney should make him or her aware of what issues surround the property. They're not going to say don't buy this property or do buy it. They're not going to say either. They're going to say, here's the issue. You have to go in with your eyes open and understand. Isn't there a, I thought you just said there was a law that these people have to tell you that this stuff is going on and it might not be sellable or saleable or whatever. Uh, it may not be saleable is, is the word you're using. During the title examination, your son or a buyer's attorney <laughs> would be doing a title examination and if they discover that there's a gas lease on the property, that should be a dialogue that that attorney has with that buyer saying, here's, here's the, the, the facts. There's a gas lease, and this gas lease prohibits you, if you look at your gas leases, it prohibits you from the day you sign the lease from building anything on the property, from planting any trees or shrubs, from putting a flower garden in, from planting vegetables, you cannot do anything to the surface of that land without the written permission of the gas company. Ooh, uh, Most people don't realize that when they look at a lease. The landmen don't tell you that, but it's, it's very clear in most leases I've read that you're not, if in fact you do, let's say your daughter was born, and you say, I'm going to plant this tree the year my daughter was born, and as this tree grows, my daughter will grow, and we're going to celebrate around this tree every, every birthday. And that gas company comes in three years later and says, I'm going to put a road right down through there. That tree's gone. Is Unless the lease, with your attorney's help, specifically says that the gas company has no surface rights. Does anybody have a booklet of guidelines out? They do not. <laughs> Most lenders now are starting to get into understanding the pieces. We have a disclosure at Tompkins Trust that I use an application to a borrower. I have that borrower say, please tell me, is there a gas lease on the property? And if there is, please be aware that that could jeopardize your ability to finance this property. But that's about as far as many lenders are, are responsible to go. It is buyer and seller coming to a meeting in the minds. It, it's not. It's not up to the lender to say to somebody, "Don't buy that because." Should a realtor, in my opinion, I believe a realtor should disclose. But that's if they know. They may not. They may not. I can't tell you how many times that we get loan applications in from borrowers. I, I refinance their property. And they'll say, no, I don't have a guest lease on the property. And we get right to the, to the closing table when my attorney reviews the title and says, well, there's this lease that was signed in 2007. 
that has a five-year term with an automatic five-year renewal. So it's still in place. And that borrower says to me, well, I thought at the end of five years it was gone. I said, no, the lease gives an automatic five-year renewal. They don't have to get your permission. The only thing they have to do is send you a check. This is a true story. This poor lady, when I talked to her myself, I said, I need you to talk to your attorney. They sent her the check for the next five-year renewal for the surface. She sent it back, so she said, as far as I'm concerned, I sent it back. It doesn't exist. You don't have to cash the check. All the gas company has to do is deliver to you the fee. This woman sent the check back. The gas company said, OK, I served my purpose by delivering the check. I don't have to have her cash it. And I said, you need to talk to your attorney. She called me back a day later and she said, I can't tell you how foolish I feel. I sent the check back. And my attorney said exactly what you said. All they have to do is deliver the check. They don't, I don't have to cash it. You had a question, sir? No? No? OK. Um, I thought you raised your hand. It's, it's pretty clear about your obligations if you're selling the gas on some road property and trying to get insurance or how to fix your mortgage. But what if it's a gas on gas lease on the property next to yours. How does that affect me? I haven't sold, you know, I haven't signed the lease well, myself, but there I am, and now I want to turn around and sell it, or I want to turn around and get insurance or something like that. And they come out to my property and say, well, wait a minute, there's a rig 240 feet from your house or that goes to one of the other things that I'm going to talk about in just a second. It's called value and marketability of your property. So hold that question just for a minute. Let's go through a couple of other bullet points here. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, as I said, FHA and VA, arguably, and by any reports that I've ever read, do about 90% of the financing in the United States. The, the mortgage document itself, here's a copy of one. It's, I don't know, 12, 15, 19 pages <coughs> with signature pages. It is now, since 2001, it's in called what's called plain language. So it's not a lot of fine print. It's big print. You can read it. It is wording that you and I understand. It's not attorney words. It is common everyday words. So I would suggest to you that if since, 19, since 2001, if you've signed a mortgage, most likely this was the document you signed in New York State. It has not changed since 2001. Section 18 of the traditional Fannie Freddie mortgage, I've got it right here, is what's called in the industry a due and sale clause. And that means you cannot sell the property and let someone else assume that loan because if you sell the property, the loan is automatically due and payable. Someone has to come back in and reapply to get their own loan. That makes sense. That's fair. The bank wants to know what the credit is of that borrower coming in that's going to be the next uh, owner. So this document's been in use since 2001 for decades. So, prohibits the transfer or sale of any portion or rights in a mortgage property without the prior written consent of the lender. So if you've signed a mortgage in 2005 and a landman came to your door in 2007 and said, I've got a deal for you, I'll pay you 500 bucks an acre, sign this lease, and you signed it, you are technically in default under the terms of your mortgage. You have violated the terms of the pledge that you gave to the bank right out of the box. Now, I don't think there's a lender in their right mind, as long as you're making payments, they're going to say, we're going to foreclose. That's not in their best interest. But it is a violation. You've said, I won't do that. 
And I charge to you that I believe the gas companies are aware that that caveat is in this document. And I've been doing this now since the 70s. And in the last 10 years, I have not been asked at any of my organizations that I've worked for, I have not been asked once by a homeowner to give them the ability, the right, write me a letter that says it's OK that I sign this gas lease. I've not been asked once. Frederick, if I may, I'm going to be the devil's advocate in this situation. Say I come to you, and I do present that to you. No. <laughs> I, <just> said, <laughs> I, I, would I want to make this possible homeowner. Yeah. I want to I know, take I, whatever financial benefit I'm going to reap from this, <clears throat> even though I know the consequences. I come to you, and, and I would be, I would have, to, I would be empathetic, but I would say, no, I'm sorry, we will not give you the right to do that. So then, what are the sanctions? You know, get to go forward and sign this. I'm sorry, I can't. Hear. What, what are the sanctions then? You say they don't foreclose. Then what do they do? I don't see any lender in the right mind that would want to foreclose on someone. What are the sanctions at this point? It's the threat. It's rattling sabers, is what I call it in the industry. It is the threat that we could, as lenders, foreclose. But I want to talk about the secondary market in just a second. But let me get to this next bullet point. Uh, pieces together. Section 21 of the same document is an environmental clause. And the environmental clause is lengthy. There's lots of words there, but if you read it, it says, you as the homeowner that pledged them that property as collateral for your mortgage loan will not allow any environmental hazards on this property, specifically naming gasoline, gas, from being stored, disposed of, discharged, or released on the property. And then it goes on to say that you can't store environmentally hazardous substances on the property. It will go on to say in there that this does not include use of gasoline for the normal operation of your house. You need gas for your lawnmower and your snowblower, right? You might have propane tanks there for heat or for cooking. So it says in there, this doesn't, this is specifically not a result or not put in place to, to uh, eliminate use of normal products in the operation of a residential structure. If you sign a gas lease, the gas lease, typical gas lease, gives the gas company the rights to come on your property and store below ground, if they want, gas, frack water, <coughs> chemicals. They could put equipment on the property. <coughs> they could do a lot of those things. That's a typical gas lease. So again, it violates section 21 of that residential mortgage document. Let's go back to that question about secondary market and standardization, which gives us all great interest rates. That's what we want. And the question, what's the sanction? Because there are some, some um, tie together. I sell this loan to, to Freddie Mac. I knew when I sold it to him that there was a gas lease on the property. I sell the loan because I don't want, as a banker, the risk, I will act as a servicing agent and make a fee paid by Fannie or Freddie, FHA, VA, as the case may be, um, to service that loan, to act as the person that talks to you when you've got questions and collects your payments. But I bundle that and pass that back through to the government, if you will, Fannie and Freddie. If something happened to the property, if something happened like a default, like you lost your job and you said, I can't make the payments anymore, or there was an environmental issue on the property and suddenly you couldn't use your water or 
there was too much noise from truck traffic and whatever, and you just, you could, your nerves were, were all jittery. And you said, take the, the property back. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would look at this and say to the lender, you knew when you sold it to us that it did not meet either of those requirements, make us whole bank, they will hold the bank responsible for any loss that was incurred. Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA are not going to take that, that long. So what, what happened? I, as the lender, the only thing I could do was would be foreclose and try for a deficiency judgment against the homeowner to try to recoup any loss that occurred. So by avoiding this as a lender, I think it's not a wise decision. Again, worst possible case, you asked worst possible case, what are the, the, the thoughts? What would it do to the secondary market? It certainly could impact it. We're going to get to the, your question here in just one second. <clears throat> Bullet point number seven, there's no cost effective way I'm going to flip here on my, uh, there's no cost effective method to establish value when there's a gas lease on the property. Let's talk about how value is established when you're <coughs> applying for a residential mortgage loan. Banks are required, any federally insured agency, FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corp, would make us as a bank, or a credit union would be on the same uh, ballpark through uh, a little different agency, but it's federal in nature, are required to get an appraisal on the property before they put a residential mortgage loan out. That appraisal needs to meet certain standards. What is common and typical in the industry is that that appraiser, licensed in New York State, would look for three similar sales, in a minimum three, similar what's called comparable sales that happened within six months and one mile of the property. Now, in rural property, rural developed rural areas, we have to go maybe a little bit more than six months. We have to go more than a mile. But the rule is comparable within a, a geographic distance and a timeline that's very established. And they have to say, all right, I want to buy 123 Main Street. I need three comparable sales that look similar, similar in size, marketability, appeal, and then the appraiser will make some adjustments to each of those comparables. Maybe one is 1,900 square feet when the subject property is only 1,800 square feet. They'll make an adjustment for the square footage difference. And they, make, they go through that mathematical <coughs> computation and come to a value. And then they establish what they call a price value. And part of that is the, the fact that it would be marketable to the general population. So there's a value and a marketability question. Back to your truck traffic. If we look at value, the appraiser may very well say, this property on a very busy road that has a lot of traffic is worth less than the exact same house on a quiet side street. Back to your question of what the, the impact is. It does impact the value of the property, and the appraisers will make monetary adjustments in establishing what the value is. It also slows the marketability. How quickly would that house sell? So what happens when, and I believe we're back to your question on truck traffic and things of that nature, is that? Well, I wasn't thinking specifically of truck traffic. I was thinking more about my ability to insure my property at all. If there is a drill right next to it. If it's 240 <laughs> foot away, in your example, and there's a drill platform, so they've got the basics. It, you know, the drilling, you know, a, a, a drill platform, takes the better part of five acres by the time you've got holding ponds and the drill platform and the rigging and all that. It takes a, a lot of space. If that was 240 feet away from your property, I would be willing to bet that most insurance companies, when they went out, 
and tried to take the snapshot of your property and looked 240 foot that way and said, wow, wow. that's a heavy industrial right. endeavor happening very close to my subject property. This doesn't fall within residential definitions. Right. Now, would they insure it? Maybe. Would the cost be different than, um, my guess is yes. From what I've heard from those insurance companies, they're saying that they can't in their best interest, and I talked to eight or 10 of them, they can't come up with a number that would adequately provide them with assurances that they could really feel comfortable. And what if I try to sell my property and the potential buyer says, okay, I'll buy your property at this amount, but I need to go get a mortgage. So the buyer goes to you and says, will you give me a mortgage for this property that's 240 feet away from that drill pad next door? Will you say yes or will you say no? If it's, if it, the, the question that you asked, if it was 240 foot away and they were applying for a conventional loan, yeah, that it was going to sell, sell the Fannie or Freddie, right. it meets the criteria. Would I offer them financing? <clears throat> Most likely, yes. Assuming that the credit and all else was, right. was, uh, was fine. Mm -hmm. But here's the difference, is when that appraisal is done on that property, that appraised value of that property is most likely going to be significantly less because of the industrial nature that's that close to it. So where you might think you've got a two hundred thousand dollar property, this is I've, I've got a gorgeous house. I paid two hundred thousand for it um, five years ago. I've kept it up. I've done some improvements. I think it should be worth at least two hundred thousand. But now I've got this new entry, this drill platform next door may very well not bring you $200,000. It may be a discount of some sort. Anything will sell, it's a matter of price. Right. Again, just one second. So it, that most likely will impact your value on the property and marketability. If I get an appraisal that says that the maximum value of this property is $100,000, even though you might think it's two hundred, dollars I'm going to say, all right, a hundred's the value, sorry, I don't care that you sold it for 200, I care, but at the end of the day, my loan amount is going to be based on some down payment from the 100,000, not a some down payment from the 200,000. So somebody wanted to buy it, maybe they have to have $10,000 down on a $100,000 loan, they got to come up with a $100,000 difference plus the 10,000, they have to have 110,000 in cash to make that deal fly. So it impacts value and marketability. There's a couple questions back here. Um, how long has fracking been going on outside of New York? And is there enough data right now from those places and statistics to say definitely this is a really good chance of what's going to happen, this is a really good chance of what's going to happen? High volume, slick water, horizontal fracking has been going on for less than five years. Now, if you talk to the gas companies, they will tell you that hydrofracking has been going on for 40 or 50 years. And it has. It has. They're absolutely telling you the truth. But it's been vertical, low volume, water only injection. It, it, the the, the injection, if you will, of the chemicals and the sand that go in and turning the drill bit and going horizontally and doing multiple fractures along that horizontal only was thought up, dreamed up 10 years ago. It's only been in operation for about five or six years. And it's not been in, in vogue in a whole lot of areas. Maryland has a, a moratorium. It was a, a program on public broadcast last night, WCNY, at 10 to 11. And, and Maryland, yeah. Maryland has a uh, moratorium on it, just like New York does at this point. Pennsylvania and Ohio were quick in. Both Pennsylvania and Ohio, with some of these points that I brought up, are now saying, uh oh, we might have shot ourselves in the blood. And our lenders don't know. I'm conversing with 
the banking department in Texas, who says, wow, Greg, thanks for bringing this to our attention. I've got a letter in my folder here from one of the people at the banking department saying, thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. We've put out a newsletter, and I've got a copy of the newsletter, to all of our bankers saying, hey guys, I want to hear some feedback on this. Greg Bang in Ithaca, New York, brought up some of these rules. Are we in trouble here? Are we in conflict? So they're doing their research. West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Maryland, Texas, all have started now to re-look at these things. I, Greg, I have a practical, real-life case study that exactly what you're talking about, whereby uh, Senator Greg Wall of New York went down to Pennsylvania last fall. He's on YouTube. You can Google it. Mm -hmm. This farm that was worth 300000 did not have a wellness property. The neighbor did. The platform went up. Then this farmer, then uh, the value of this farm was five generations, $300,000. Platform went up on a neighbor's property. They then received contaminated water. And Greg Ball said that that value was between $29,000 and $9,000. They could not sell the property. Now, what you're talking about in terms of mortgages, that was a cash-owned family farm. But if, if, if someone borrowed uh, $280,000 and then $80,000, $20,000 into it, if they had contaminated water, what you're talking about is they can walk from that loan and say, I'll eat the $20,000. The bank goes after the party for a default judgment. There's no, he has no money. He, he's, and he walked away from $20,000. So the bank is hung out to dry, and the secondary mortgage market is hung out to dry, and therein lies the practical problem of if this becomes systemic and endemic from New York, whereby wells are contaminated, the value of the mortgages all go belly up. You're right. I, I, I'm not an alarmist, and, and I am happy that New York still has a moratorium. For now. For now. I was very active before, during the common period. Uh, I'm, uh, I guess I need a hobby. You, you've heard with my introduction that I, I volunteer at the United Way and Lutheran Homes Foundation. And um, my, my wife and I sit down on Monday morning and I say, uh, I guess something Monday night and Tuesday and Wednesday. So, Honey, I'll bring pizza on Friday. See ya. <laughs> She's a good sport. Um, but, I've been to Albany a number of times, I've talked to them, I have written letters, I have tried in the, in the banking industry to get a number of my banker friends to write letters to just make New York State aware of the conflicts. I don't want to raise a red flag or jump to a conclusion, but if in fact there is uh, a, a, a ripple effect. This ripple effect could hamper the industry that I make my living in. I want my daughters, 28 and 25, to be able to get a mortgage loan. I'm figuring that I'm their dad and I should be able to guide them through that process pretty well. I've got a little bit of experience. So I want to preserve it for the next generation. And that's why I do things like this. No one's paying me to do this. I get nothing out of this other than trying to educate. If, in fact, we don't do something, and the an investor, you know, these mortgages are packaged into bundles and sold to investors all over the world. So let's say China has a package of $100 billion of residential mortgage loans, and they decide that they're going to do some quality control check, and they find out that there's leases on some of those loans in that pool, they're going to go back to Fannie and Freddie and say, pay us our money. We don't want these. It's not what you told me. Fannie and Freddie then ripples it back to the bank. Now, do you want your bank stall in one or two? No, we don't want that. So the bank is going to go after John Homeowner or Susie Homeowner that maybe didn't tell us what was going on. It's a problem. There could be a ripple. <coughs> Since China owns a lot of the leases, and they also are, if they look at these mortgages that they have bought, 
say China buy the leases, but that China corporations own them. Is there any conflict there? That, I mean, they own, uh, when they default, can they default and get all the land as well? Can they take the land instead of making your bank? If they hold the mortgages. I, I, maybe China was a bad, bad example. No, no, no. Anyway, whoever it is, can someone that holds those mortgages, like, not come back to you? Could they default on the land and take the land? Yeah, the, they're, not, they're not going to, the, there's no way that they can come and grab the property yeah, that's my question. without due process. Due process would mean there'd have to be a default on the borrower's part, the, the homeowner's part, they'd have to serve it in court, they'd have to go through the, the courts. I can't imagine that that would happen. That would be stopped long before this investor in China or overseas said, to you, get out of your property, I own it. You would have to default and have to go through due process. There are very specific regulations. Now, could be, behind the scenes, could the investor say to Freddie Mac, this isn't what I thought I bought. Give me my money back. They could do that. And then Freddie Mac could come back to the bank and say, this isn't what I thought I bought. Give me my money back, bank. And then the bank is either going to have to make a decision. Do we foreclose? Or do we say, all right, well, I guess we're going to own this loan. And as long as the borrowers keep paying. <laughs> I think a bigger problem for some of the people in the Graphic area where you know, the geography is right for this to be going on. Uh, you can run the risk of Freddie or Fannie uh, or the secondary market saying this isn't an area that you really want to buy loans from right. because of the risk, which would then make it really difficult for people that live within that community because if the local banks couldn't sell to the secondary market, they'd be forced to hold in all the risk in their own portfolios and they couldn't do that. And let's, let's just do, and you're absolutely right, Steve. Let's do the math together. Banks in the, in the old days, if you will, um, they would take deposits in the front door and they could loan that, those deposits that the money was in the vault, if you will. They could loan just what they had in deposits. So if they had $100 million in deposits, once they made $100 million in mortgage loans, they'd have to say, time out. I can't make any more loans until I get more deposits in the front door. The secondary market, what that did was allow lenders to say, okay, I've got $5 million. I make that, those $5 million in loans. I sell those to Fannie Freddie's secondary market. I get my $5 million back and I use it again. And make another $5 million, and another, and another, and another, and another. So what would happen is that cost of residential mortgage funds would rise, and the availability would certainly get tougher. To your point, if, if the secondary market said, I'm not willing to do this. Now, in this area, you're too shallow. Marcellus Shale, geographically, I'm a little off my point, which is mortgage lending, but the Marcellus Shale is too shallow right here. They're not going to drill here for Marcellus. Utica shell is another thing. It's deeper. And they'll have the opportunity. Better be down the road some. My first argument is that when you have a producing gas pump, the land is value, the higher value is true. There is not any, uh, you, you hear that a lot from people um, who, in fact, are. <clears throat> advocating that, but there's no statistical data to support that in New York State yet. Maybe it'll come. I talked to an appraiser who does a lot of work in the Southern Tier, where they are leasing up every ounce of space in the Southern Tier, and I talked to him yesterday, he called me, he keeps me in touch, and he said, I just had a rash of deals blow up because there's new home builders that are saying, I'm going to hold on to the subsurface rights. I'm just going to sell the surface rights. And they, they build the new house. They get right to the closing table. And the buyer's attorney says, you realize that you're only buying the surface. You're not buying fee simple. You don't have any subsurface rights. 
You don't know what that lease could, could allow to be done. And the buyers have said, nope, I don't want it. And they've walked away. So they've had this uh, fairly big builder in the southern tier who went and built a bunch of houses and thought, I'm just going to keep this subsurface rights, thinking that when they do drill, I'm going to strike it rich. And he wound up saying, never mind. I'll go back to fee simple. There's, there's not statistical data to support that in, in this area. Uh, I'll take it a step further. Hang on one second. I, I know I've got you next hand. Um, in Pennsylvania, the amount of people that, quote, strike it rich, is a very small percent of the total land. It's, it's not. And if you really do the statistic, the research, it's not, and I'm a little off my topic on mortgage now, but it's not everybody that's going to be rich. There's some, but not everybody. <clears throat> you were first, and then I got you. All right. Uh, I had another meeting, but I just went to, <clears throat> you said that if, if they drill so many thousand feet, I forgot, 2,000 feet below, they can go right under your property without any information whatsoever from another property even if it's a mile away. And they said that, uh, that most of these people that are signing these leases are only getting maybe $500 a month, which isn't a large amount of money at all. Then the big scheme of things. And that's why that surface or subsurface, that's why it's a conflict with, with the way we do business in, in New York State. Now, in some states, they've separated decades ago surface and subsurface rights. So they've got a way to value property. I haven't got quite through my appraisal one yet, but I'm going to come back to that in just one second. This gentleman's been very patient. Is it true that if a landowner signs up and he's taking the money over the course of years, whatever the money is, and there is a disaster on the property, that both the drilling company and the persons or persons that signed up with the oil company are also liable? Um, I'm not going to quite agree with you there. The oil company, if you look at standard lease, there's nothing in the lease to protect the homeowner against any losses as a result of their operation. If you go into, and again, I'm off my topic of mortgages, so this is sort of an off-the-record uh, comment, but if you go in and look at, here's a great article. I've only got a few of these. Um, if you look at, Chesapeake's annual statements, what they're, they're called 10K filings. Chesapeake, right in their 10K filings, will say we are woefully uninsured, uninsured, underinsured. You got a stack. stack of them there? I, I'm quoted in here a lot. At Beth Raynow and I, and Joe Heath, who's an attorney out of Syracuse, did a seminar in Newfield on Friday night. We talked about some of this. So the, the gas companies typically do not have insurance to protect the homeowner. The homeowner is responsible, or could be responsible. We're in a litigious society. You know, people are going to sue somebody. So there's nothing in a standard lease that says if there's a problem and it causes you know, a, a, a ripple effect, we'll, we'll defend you against any claims that are made against you. That doesn't exist in a standard place. So the homeowner is really the one responsible. So you're holding back for the $500 you get. Yeah. Or whatever you get. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever you get. <coughs> Chesapeake was at the Mohawk Valley Institute or Mohawk Valley Community College on Saturday. And there were three people. There was a lawyer, an engineer, and some kid from uh, Whitesboro who was uh, uh, working for Chesapeake for the first two years, and, and they just talked, you know, roses were just spouting out all over. And there were up three other people who were on the other side of the table, and they came 500 miles yesterday from Virginia, or Saturday, between Virginia and Pennsylvania, to show movies, time lapse photography of 90 minutes. This is how many trucks went by 25, 30 big haul truckers. 
and they show pictures of the roads deteriorating, polluted water, uh, explosions on uh, the drilling platforms, so you name it, it was a horror story. But these people pay out of pocket to, to come up to, to Utica to tell a real story, and pictures, movies don't lie. It's too much. And again, I'm, I'm not taking a pro or a con stance. I am saying that there are significant conflicts for residential lending. Let's go back to appraisals. The leases typically, and we've got about 20 minutes left, leases typically are not recorded. Interesting, huh? Leases are typically not recorded. You will get what's called a memorandum of lease recorded, and that just says ABC Oil Company has been granted a lease on 123 Main Street. And that's about all it says. It's a one page. Hang on a second. You're gonna, you're, you're, you've got to hear the rest of this before you. They don't record them. Why? Do you think? Yeah. They don't want the neighbor to know what deal they cut with you. Did your neighbor get $600 an acre or $400 an acre? And if you only got $500 an acre, you're going to be mad that you didn't get $600. Or if you're the guy with $400, you're going to be mad. So that's one potential reason. When an appraiser goes to establish value on a property, that in, they want to compare three similar properties to the subject. If the subject had a lease on it, the appraiser would need to know the terms of that lease. What was paid per acre, and what royalties are you going to get, and under what terms and conditions. And then the appraiser would have to go on all three of those comparables and get a copy of that lease as well to look at that. Because leases are not typically recorded, it's just a memorandum of lease, the appraiser doesn't have that ability. Even if they did a title examination, which really should be an attorney doing that, they might only just hear or see that there is a lease recorded, but no terms of the lease. So there's no way that appraiser can effectively do their job meeting their licensing requirements in New York State to compare apples to apples. They don't know if it's 500, 400, 300, 150 bucks an acre. They don't know if it's an eighth or a quarter or a half in percentage that they're getting for royalties and under what terms and conditions. So we go back to value again. And the lender follows very specific secondary market guidelines, guidelines of the Appraisal Institute and the licensing in New York, and they can, in fact, get an appraisal with three comparables because there's no way to get those other three leases. You can go to the seller of the property or the, the homeowner and say, give me a copy of your lease on the subject property, but am I going to knock on your door and say, I need your lease? Most of the leases, by the way, say in here, you are not to share this information with anyone. There's not a UCC filing for that lease? <laughs> We've got a couple of other quick tidbits, and then I'm just going to uh, open it up for general questions for a couple minutes. Title insurance is something we haven't <laughs> talked about. Uh, it's, it's a big issue. Lenders typically ask for title insurance on residential properties, commercial as well. What the title insurance does is a company goes out, they review the history of the property back at least 40 years and sometimes longer than that, and say, the chain of custody, if you will, the chain of ownership is adequate. I can prove that there was a warranty deed from Joe to Sue to Pete to to Sally, and I can follow that. Any mortgage loans have been paid off and discharged properly. There's no intervening liens. There's no wills that haven't been probated that have left a possible error to this property. You know, 
in the wings, if you will. They ensure that the title is clear of any liens, encumbrances. Okay? Title insurance policies don't protect against any of the environmental issues that may result from heavy industrial use, if you will, not residential title policies. Lenders, some attorneys will say an Ulta 9, an environmental endorsement, will take care of that. And I will tell you that after talking to a lot of title companies and looking at the environmental endorsement, the environmental endorsement really protects and offers to make good on surface damage as a result of an accidental environmental issue, such as grass, shrubs, trees, and whatever. But it doesn't take care of anything else. It's not meant <coughs> to insure against that heavy industrial operation that is a result of gas drilling. I'll take it a step further. Texas, they've been drilling for a while and gas in Texas longer than anywhere else, wouldn't you think, that they'd have it down? There's a bill that's been introduced in Texas that the title insurance company has had something to say about where they want to effectively, specifically, exclude title insurance coverage as a result of gas drilling operations. This is a bill introduced in Texas about six months ago that's working its way through where they're going to specifically exclude it. So when you hear that uh, we get an Ulta 9 or get what's called an Ulta 9 an environmental writer, Texas is actually specifically, specifically in their language um, eliminating coverage as a result of any gas or oil or mineral exploration or operation. Greg, in New York State, what you said is in Texas, uh, if, you want to, if you want to change how business is done, you can do it from the bottom up, but in New York State it seems like you do it from the top down. If, are you aware of any legislation that's floating through New York State Assembly or through the Senate that would alter some of these rules and regulations that were put in place for Homeowner protection. Well, and I, I shook my head and then I, I'm going to change my mind. Barbara Lipton has introduced seven bills in the assembly. She has gotten a lot of momentum in the assembly. I have been to testify in the assembly on some of those issues, but she can't get the Senate to address them. What is your question? Now, I, I'm not being political, but I know Barbara, I know she's passionate about it. I've got a letter that Maurice Hinchy sent after I had supplied some information, and he gathered some other information, sent to the regulators that manage Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. It's called Federal Housing Finance, so FHFA, Federal Housing Finance Agency. And the letter back to Maurice Hinchy, I have, that says 200 feet, you know, homeowner's insurance, all of these bullet points, the lender is responsible to ensure that they comply with those guidelines and there's no imminent plan to change those regulations. I, I look at that as a pretty clear signal to me as a lender that I need to be diligent that we, in fact, and there's many lenders that are starting to do this and saying, if there's a gas lease on the property, we, we cannot put residential financing on it. We're, we're not doing title searches on surrounding properties because it's very expensive. We're taking some level of risk there because it could be that your property is only 150 feet by 150 feet and your next door neighbor's got a gas lease and that's within 200 feet. And by the letter of the law, that makes it ineligible. We're taking some risk, but I, we can in the industry, um, we, we'd be raising the cost on mortgage financing if we had to do title searches on all the surrounding properties. 
title search, three, four hundred dollars each. So we, there's, there's a lot of conflicts as they, <coughs> as they relate to residential mortgage lending. There are letters that are going around now. I've got a copy of one that went to um, Shenango County residents that said, oil and gas hydrocarbon deed in Shenango, New York. Shenango County, New York. And it, it spells out in this letter saying, if you need quick cash, you want to pay off existing debt, you want to realize capital gain taxes before the tax rates increase, you want to diversify your asset holdings, pay for college education, clean up estate planning, provide liquidity for another investment, buy a dream home, or finance a home renovation, plan a wedding, eliminate uncertainty of drilling. Sell us your hydrocarbon rights. It's the subsurface rights. They're trying to get you to split the estate. <coughs> there was in this letter, and a homeowner gave it to me, it's from a land company that's trying to do that. Nowhere's in here does it say that check with your lender, because if you have a mortgage, you have to get the lender's permission. So that's the kind of thing that's being sent in the mail. People are knocking on doors. There are more things in conflict. Don't sign uh, any legal document without checking with a real estate attorney. Or, or a good attorney to go over those details. What about in the area of compulsory integration? I've been thinking about it a lot, and it scares me to death. And I went and I read the law that was passed some years back for compulsory integration. Pennsylvania does not have compulsory integration. Right. So you can't look to them to see how this is going to play out. New York is going to be special. Now, <laughs> Uh, if I understand it from having read that law, um, once the gas company has 60% of its 640-acre space in uh -huh. they will then send notice to all the other homeowners and the other 40% said, okay, we're ready to go. Here is your choice. You can either participate and we'll send you a pendulum little check, or you can check the box that says, no, thank you, keep your dirty money but you're still forced to participate anyway. There is no third box saying, please go away and leave me alone. And if you, don't, if you don't respond at all, you don't come to the town meeting, if you just throw it in the trash and cover your eyes and your ears and say, it's not happening, it's not happening, you will be deemed to be participating but not accepting the check. So my question for you, and the question I have heard so many people around me ask when I tell them about this is, Wait a minute, if I check the box that says, okay, I'll participate, I'll take your piddly money, am I now leasing, and how does that affect my mortgage? Am it, I in default of my mortgage if I take the piddly little check? In, in theory. Even though I've been compelled, I had no choice. You were compelled by law. I was compelled it, by it, law. It is, it is a default. Uh, I'm going to go back it to is, it. It is the, a default. That you would consider that a default. It is a default, but again, let me tell you that I can't, uh, I don't know a lender in their right mind that would, right. you know, do any foreclosure. There's three options you've got in compulsory integration. One is that you pay for your proportionate share of the drug cost and you become a partner with a gas company. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for profit or for loss. Right. Um, the other is that you say, um, send me a check after all the expenses are paid and, and all the costs and, and whatever, and it's a small percentage. And, and then there's a third option that's sort of somewhere in between um, where you can participate partially. Um, that's by, by regulation. Um, if you don't do anything, the, by default, you get the least of those checks. And the thought was in New York State, to be fair, if there was going to be a taking of something that belonged to you, right. that you I should understand. be paid for it, so New York State put that in place. So I think that the thought process was honorable. I think there yeah. was just a little bit of a twist. I, I use this as an example. There's no option out. I can there, there's no option out. 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 And, and it would default. It right. would trigger technical, technical default. Technical. 
I, I, I use this example pretty, pretty frequently. There's a nice pen. Um, if you gave me a dollar for it, would you agree to that? And then I pull this out and I take the ink refill out of it. Right. And then I say, okay, give me my dollar. Right. Did you think you got a deal? <laughs> Probably not. No. That's, that's what's happening when you're selling part of that bundle of rights that you own when you buy a house, when you buy residential real estate. Fee simple is you have a bundle of rights. And if you give away some of those rights, it would lead to logic would tell you that what you've got left is not going to be worth right. what you have. And maybe I wouldn't even know that until a year from now, I decided to retire to Florida and I tried to sell my house and then discovered nobody wanted to buy my house or no one could get a mortgage to buy my yeah, house. It's, it's, because you, the lender, would say, oh, we'll it, okay. it could be. We have a, a form that we give an application <coughs> that asks, do you have a gas lease? Are you aware of a gas lease? And if you don't know because you're buying the property, have the seller sign this. That that really certifies that there's no gas lease. And even though we have that, we get to the closing table in our week before, and our bank attorney will say, oh, there's a gas lease that showed up here. Right. Most people thought that they were going to expire after five years. They didn't know that there was an automatic five-year renewal. Most people don't understand that if they come in and do geophysical testing, that's a big word, geophysical testing, um, they automatically get an um, evergreen, if you will, almost um, ability to continue that lease forever. If they come and poke the hole in the ground and drill down and say, this is a good spot, we think this will work, the lease terms give them the rights to have that forever. And the spacing units are forever also. If Correct. I understand that law correctly. Once they announce what the spacing limits are, they file that. And that's it. So however those people signed it off at the time of the spacing unit, in that 30-day window of notice, <clears throat> goes with it forever. That's my understanding. That's it's my a little understanding outside the mortgage, yeah. mortgage realm, so this is one of the off the record things. But from a lender's <laughs> perspective, you would then look at that and say, well, wait a minute, that house is in that spacing unit. They made that, that's public. And you would consider that when you're considering the value of the home whether it was in an announced value, marketability, right. can we in fact meet the setback requirements? Correct. It's a problem. I've written letters, I suggest you do, call your, your um, Senate and Assembly people, let them know that you're aware that there are mortgage conflicts. They know too. The Bar Journal in November had a huge article written by Beth Radar, there's a copy of it back there, which is a great Wall Street Journal. Ian Irvani has written numbers of articles in the Wall Street Journal, or, I'm sorry, the New York Times, uh, about this. They're aware, they read those things too. They know the conflicts. So whether or not they're fracking, they could still have space in it. Because that's an announced that they Yeah, they, they, they could. That right now they're just trying to um, get get the uh, the land leased and and then they'll sit with a map and slice it and dice it and come up with spacing units so that they get the compulsory integration for those that right. might not sign a lease. Exactly. Now, they can, I, if you're compulsory integrated, they cannot come on the surface of your property, but they, you, can, go but they can go underneath it. So it is it is that fee simple issue again that we started out with. You had a question. Well, a comment. Uh, my son is a new professor up at Ithaca College. He was house signing uh, about 10 months ago, and there they found a beautiful country house that a professor from Cornell had. Every place around this property was, was leased. They ran. He uh, said, it's a beautiful house, but we don't want to take the chance of <coughs> as going through property being compromised. And so, you might want to worry about you know, being able to sell your property to have your uh, gas company. I, I am seeing more and more people, once they find out that there's a lease on the property, they are walking away, stepping back from transactions. Um, I told you about one down in the southern tier um, in an Elmira area that 
you know, this builder thought for sure, because so they're really hot for this to happen. It's a depressed market area, and they, they believe that this will be their salvation. I've, I've been a, a number of different, I turn this off so we can let this thing cool down for a second. Um, they, um, I, I've been to a number of presentations where economic people look at this, and right now, the cost per million cubic feet, I think that's the measurement of gas, the price is under $2 per million cubic feet. They cannot economically make sense to put millions of dollars into drilling, to build new drill rigs and roads and, and you know, whatever. It's not going to happen now. As a matter of fact, the economics folks are saying to me very clearly, and to anybody that, that listens, this will not pay anything to this generation. It will be the next generation, if anybody, gets any money. Because right now, at less than $2 per million cubic feet, they can't make it work. Financially, it doesn't make sense to put millions of dollars into it. Now, what does make sense, and you saw it on the TV program last night, um, I, I've, I've been involved in several, Susan Arbetter did a, a TV program that I was on uh, a few months back, that if, if they can buy leases for $500 an acre and sell them for $2,000 an acre to an overseas investor, well, there's a way to make money there. And that's what's going on right now. Sorry. I'm kind of listening and absorbing everything. I'm not pro or against, but you stuck a nerve, and I just want to piggyback off what she said. If you're a landowner or a homeowner, you have to follow along with the majority because everybody right. else is true. Okay. You're damned if you do and damned if you don't. That's how I but see it. But on the flip side, and no offense to you, Greg, I don't have a lot of confidence in the banking industry, hence the bail of Freddie Mac and Fannie and all the mortgage companies. You're going to protect your interest in the banks you represent. Oil companies are going to protect their injury. We're the people in the middle. And we get screwed. They get screwed. <clears throat> We're the little people that got you, your wealth, and the company their wealth. It seems like we're getting screwed. And in my I, opinion, in my opinion. Oil is not the only thing that runs downhill. <laughs> I understand. If I understand this correctly, we're screwed even if they never come onto the land and start fracking right. because the leases will tie us up right. and make it impossible for us to turn around and sell or just carry out the normal it, stuff. It very well could. It very well could. That's, that's the part that you had a question a couple minutes ago, and I never did get back to you. Actually, it was for the gentleman back here. You said your son was about to buy a property, correct? And he found out all the properties around him were leased to these oil companies or gas companies. Since the leases are not being reported, how did he find out this information? It must have been told to him by the, the, the uh, real estate agent. Okay, so he has a good agent. Yeah. Here, here's here's my piece of advice. My my five cent. I'm Lucy in the in the Charlie Brown uh, thing. I set up my five cent. Uh, um, you know uh, the monster. Yeah. yeah. Um, you really really need oh, to, as an individual, get a skilled attorney that knows leases. There are ways. I believe there are ways that they could protect you, and we're seeing it in some instances where land coalitions are coming in and I, I don't want to believe it, and I, you know, but I think sooner or later they're going to drill. So what you want to do is if we're going to get stuck with that, to do everything to kind of protect your interests. And some of the land coalitions I'm seeing now are very, writing very stiff leases that hold the, the, the gas companies responsible for any physical damage, making them buy insurance policies to protect, providing all those safeguards that we all believe are the right thing to do, and then setting back so that there's far enough setbacks so that you can buy and sell houses like you've typically done. But you've got to do that with a good real estate attorney. 
don't go to the general practitioner that does a real estate closing today and then tomorrow he's going to do a will and then the next day he's going to do a divorce. You got to get somebody who's really skilled. And where do you find such a thing? Because uh, I don't know any of them and I don't know anyone I would trust. There, so there are how far do you have to go to find someone who really understands there, there are good real estate attorneys who really specialize in real estate who, who are around there. You, you've got to ask around. I would be remiss if I started throwing names around. I, I know a couple in Syracuse that I feel comfortable with. I know some down in the Cortland at the Comarket. But up here, I, I'm not as familiar. Well, I think if, if you take the initiative to ask the questions that we posed there today, someone who's working with you on as an attorney, and they don't have good answers for it, you just won't. Then you realize. But that's the part. 